I saw a movie the other day. <coughs> I remember the name of the movie. <coughs> the name of the movie is A Murder in Canaan. Oh, come on. A Murder in Canaan. And it's supposed to be a true story. It took place in Canaan, Connecticut. There was an 18-year-old. He looked very, boy, you know, looked very boyish. He just turned 18. I guess 18 really isn't all that old for a young man. His mother he had no father that he knew of. His mother was an alcoholic and not well respected in the town. Uh, his story was that his mother told him that she was raped. Uh, I think in New York City, and she didn't know who the, so she didn't know who his father was. And according to the movie, he was a simple kid, maybe the way kids used to be in, in the 50s. I, this took place probably around the 50s, or that's what the scenery looked like to me, around the 50s. And he was just a simple kid that wanted to play his guitar. So the way the movie, and a very, just, kind, unaggressive, simple kid claimed that he loved his mother. And so the, the movie starts with him saying, with his mother saying, be careful, come home, uh, come home early or something, things that mothers usually say. And he said, oh, mom, I'm 18, I'm okay. And in the next scene, he comes home with his guitar yeah, and he finds his mother dead. And uh, she's dead, this is a true story. She's all stabbed up, blood all over the place, and her two legs were broken above the knee. So he's very, he's not, uh, he's not an emotional kid. Do you have to be emotional? Uh, he calls the, uh, calls the hospital. He thought she was alive. He thought that she was still breathing. He called the hospital, and she called the police. The police get there. There's the local, it's a small town, so the local police that know him. And it turns out that he was with these neighbors. If, thank God for the, thank God. I'll tell you, the movie didn't say anything about the kid going to church, didn't say anything about God, didn't say anything about Jesus, but you cannot tell me that the positive, that it would have turned out the way it turned out if there's not a God in heaven that really cares for people that are truly not spiritually innocent, we know that, but innocent in this world. <laughs> and then we come into this world with blessings and curses and terrible things happen to some people and really miraculous things happen to others that don't even know his name. There's so much we don't understand. So the police come and there's one couple neighbors that apparently he would have a fight with his mother what teenager doesn't have a fight with their mother and he would go stay with the teenager, with the neighbors? And this uh, hotshot state police officer comes in and he decides that the kid killed his mother. No, absolutely no reason he decides the kid killed his mother. So he calls the kid in the house, he asks him to take his clothes off, he has to look at his hands, there was blood everywhere, no, no blood on his clothes. He made him strip naked. No blood on his body. The kid was like in shock, just very passive looking, in, in shock. They, they, um, uh, they took him into custody and the kid was 18 in a town. And the way the movie presents it, and I'm sorry if this is offensive to anybody, I don't know what's going on today in the world, but back in the 50s, a lot of small town people were very ignorant. One woman said that she'd never been to the police department before. She'd never been to the police. People just, when when not sophisticated, the average person is just the way it is. They were, compared to people today, they were childlike. But they were they were mature in their knowledge that they had to work and, and provide a home and, and that they had homes and they raised children and they provided food and they raised their children. They were mature in that way, but in 
as far as the world goes, they were simple, simple, ignorant folk. Ignorance is not, not a bad word. So this one woman was like really fighting for him, the neighbor that, that really, uh, that he would go to. You know. And uh, he was playing with his band. He was, he was, he was playing with his band the whole time. You know. So anyway, they, they took him into custody. They gave him a little something to read. This was at the time that the Miranda rights had just come out. We have to give someone, read some of their rights and let give them a phone call. He wasn't allowed to call anybody. He was exhausted. He was hungry. They wouldn't let him sleep. Uh, and they, according to the movie, completely manipulated a, a confession out of him. That they confused this kid so severely. Okay, they, they gave him a lie detector test over and over again, prompting him to give certain answers. It was, it was terrible. It was, it, it was nothing less than evil. Nothing less than evil what they did to this young man. And nobody, they wouldn't let the neighbor to, uh, talk to him. He couldn't receive a phone call. And he didn't even know that he needed a lawyer. He was so ignorant. And it just so happens, just so happens, see, don't tell me that God's not in control of this world. And yes, terrible things happen. Well, he's in control of this world. If he lets them happen, he lets them happen. But he didn't let it happen here. I don't know who this kid was in, in heaven. I don't know who this kid was. Well, who prayed for him? Maybe his mother was in church every day. I don't know if they say she was an alcoholic. I, not one word of God in the movie. Yeah. So it just so happens that this sophisticated New York couple moves into town. One of them is a writer, and the other one is, I think her husband was an engineer. I'm sorry, they were sophisticated and they were ignorant people. Everybody's not the same. So the woman that's concerned about the kid, that wants to get him a change of clothing, wants to give him food, she's actually chastising the local police officers that she knows. You better take care of that kid. Why are you taking him in? I'm wanting him to change of clothing. They wouldn't give him any comfort at all. So this woman is just like walking down the street or she's in the local store or something. And, and this woman walks in and you can just look at her and you can see she's this, you can see sophistication on the face of somebody. You don't want to believe that, you need to wake up because everybody's not the same, brethren. Everybody's not the same. And that's why whatever we have, if someone asks us for, asks us for help in any area that we're capable of giving it, now, without damaging ourselves, anything that we, we are absolutely obligated to help anyone that asks us unless it's against our own best interest. You need to know that. That you don't live in this world for yourself, and you don't live in this world just for your blood family. You don't know who God's going to bring up to you. You're obligated to do the best you can for them, especially if you're a believer. So. This sophisticated looking woman walks into the local shop and the, the friend of the boy says, well, who, who are you? And, are you new here? And she says, yes, my husband and I, we just moved out here. This is really funny. We wanted to get away from the, from the pressure of the city. <laughs> and they just happened to move into this small town where the woman didn't even know where the police station, where she where had never been inside of the police station. So she tells this writer the story and the writer says, well, can nobody talk to him? No, we call, they won't let us talk to him. Do, do, do you know what's happened recently about these Miranda rights, that they have to read him his rights and let him call a lawyer? No, what's Miranda rights? I, I've never even, well, well, I've never even, she said you should go down to the police station. And, and the, the friend says, I, I, would you believe I've never, I've lived here my whole life, I've never been in the police station. Would you go with me? So the writer goes with the friend, the, the woman who's a friend of the boy, and they won't let, uh, the police officer would not let them see him or talk to him. Okay. While they're interrogating him, putting words in his mouth, actually putting words in his mouth, and the kid was so tired and exhausted, he just signed it. Never in a million years thinking that they were going to convict him of murder of his own mother. They got him to sign the confession. 
and would not let anybody see him or talk to him. Okay. So in the meantime, there's an advocate. An advocate. Can you can you see this? An advocate. Not one word about Jesus. Okay. A good intention for a woman who was a writer. And the, and, and the one thing that one of the things I got out of this movie was what a, what a crime that we've lost our fourth estate. I think the death of the fourth estate of journalism in this nation is the worst of all of the deaths that we have experienced. The power of the press is enormous. You see. So she's a little, as I said, more sophisticated, trying to help the woman, and. Uh, and they, they can't see him. So the, what, what she said was, he, he needs to get a lawyer. He needs to get a lawyer. But she had a husband and a very young child, and the child looked about two. The, the writer's child was about two. So she just went home. But in the meantime, the young man's in jail with a hardened criminal. Now, all I hear about these days is you put an 18-year-old boy in a jail with a hardened criminal and he's in danger of being raped. The thought of it is just a nightmare and a horror. Mm -hmm. But this young kid gets locked up with a hardened criminal and he says to him, what's a nice kid like you doing in jail? And the young man tells him what happened and he, and he gets advice from this hardened criminal. You need a lawyer. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. And actually helps him to get a lawyer from the inside of jail. He gets a, a phone book and he picks a lawyer. And then somehow he gets to the tele. Oh yeah, the, the hardened criminal uh, calls the police officer over and says, he's entitled to a phone call. He didn't get his phone call. And because someone that knew what they were talking about was making the demand, he was allowed, the young man was allowed to make his phone call. And he picked this woman who may or may not have been the best lawyer, but she came running to help him. And uh, it was a, a town meeting. The, the, you had to see this kid. It was a really simple kid. Didn't, didn't have a clue as to what was going on. He was, like, confused. And, uh, and the district attorney, or whoever the, the town prosecutor, whatever the word is in Connecticut, whatever the title is in Connecticut, Gave him a hundred thousand dollar bail. Was it hundred forty? I'm sorry, forty five. For those people, no, for a hundred thousand, forty five thousand, no difference. Forty five thousand dollar bail. Didn't have a relative in the town. Didn't have a relative anywhere. Just this one neighbor, you know. And uh, so they called a town meeting. The people came. Some of them believed he was guilty because the police thought he was guilty. Look at this idolatry for your government. I'm sorry to say that I'll never think about my government the same again. I'll, I'm, I'm assuming this country is going to get cleaned up and we're going to have a regeneration here. I'll never think about governmental authority on any level the same way again. Because I myself had an idolatry. Never, I knew about corrupt policemen. You hear about it here or there, but basically I expected police and firemen to help me. And probably it's true that the majority of police and firemen are okay, but you never know which one you're getting, brethren. I have lost my virginity over and over and over and over again, okay? I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I have a godly mistrust for governmental authority. I have a godly mistrust for anyone that has power over me except God. Because I know what's in the heart of men. See? Shilly or pessimist. Well, Jesus said the same thing. The scriptures said the same thing. He didn't attach himself to anyone because he knew what was in the hearts of men. 45000 dollars bail. But this kid had nowhere to go. So they called the town meeting. They got together a thousand dollars. They had a bake sale. They had $2,000. It was like hopeless. And the friend, the woman and her husband, who were friends, speak up and say, look, this kid's not a flight risk. He's not going to go anywhere. I'm willing to put my house up for bail money. That means 
in case those of you, those of you that don't know. If he skips town, they lose the house, but the kid would probably be living with them. He's, he's not going anywhere. He didn't do anything. You know. Nobody else would put up their house. And I don't know what the house was worth, but apparently it wasn't $45,000. $45, well, would you believe it? Okay, the writer writes a story about it. And some unknown woman, not named in the movie, calls up the writer and says, I'm going to put up bail for this kid. Someone actually put up the whole $45,000 for this kid. This is a true story. I would really like to know what happened to the kid after this was all over. There was no follow-up on the movie at all. So someone paid his bail. He came out on bail. And then there's a trial. Would you believe that they actually convicted him of murder? That the judge, the judge was prejudiced against this kid. I don't know why the judge would be against him. The lawyer did a pretty good job. She interrogated the police officers that manipulated him. She showed on the stand. She made mincemeat out of them on the stand. The officers that the officer that gave the lie detector test over and over and over again, programming him to get the right answers, confusing him, telling him that sometimes when you do something like that, you're in shock and you don't remember it. That's what they're telling him. You're in shock, you don't remember it. He said, but I didn't do it. I don't remember Well, You're in shock. You don't remember because you're in shock. That's what they were telling him. Yeah. Yeah. And he's actually convicted. Yeah. And uh, he's in shock that he's convicted, so he comes for sentencing. Oh, wait, wait, I left, I left the part out. The jury, the jury is a hung jury. Okay. The majority of the people wanted to find him innocent, but a few people wanted to find him guilty. So they came out and they asked the judge to see the tapes again, some tapes of his being interrogated, I guess. And the judge manipulated the jury. Okay, I don't know how to explain to you what he did, but he manipulated the jury into saying they had to reach, they had to reach an immediate decision, which was not true, and they found the kid guilty. Do you believe this? True story. Then the kid comes for sentencing, and he's allowed to write a letter to the judge, and other people wrote letters on his behalf. His lawyer stands up and says, this is really a travesty of, um, of justice. It was not proven, it was just simply not proven that he killed her. Not only that, but he was playing with his band at the same time. It's not even possible, not even possible that he did it. No blood on the body, okay? She was beaten so badly that her legs were broken. Not a mark on his hands or his body. I'm asking you for a suspended sentence. And the judge says, I read your letter and I see no remorse. And the lawyer said, remorse? You're on it. He's claim, he claims he's innocent. How could you expect remorse? So the judge gave him a sentence of not less than five years or more than 16 years for manslaughter. And the kid went to jail. And he was in jail for, I think, about a year and a half. But this woman kept writing her, her writing, whatever. She was a freelance writer, wherever she got it published. And for those of you that don't know this, Connecticut, there, there are a lot of wealthy, very wealthy areas in Connecticut. And it was mentioned in the movie that uh, some of his wealthy uh, neighbors kicked in money to get him another trial. And uh, she named a couple of names that I recognize, but I don't recall them to, to, to share them with you. So they got him another trial. Was there, so the time the movie was taking place at the time of the new trial. and. Uh, and he was released, was another judge. And they came up with another wit another witness that it, it came up with the two, two significant things, aside from the fact that there was no proof that he did it. The woman who received the call from the hospital was lying, was lying. Because the, the timing, the timing was so close, you know, the time that he called the woman the time that she died. He, could, he couldn't possibly have done it. He was playing with a band and with a group of, where a whole bunch of people were seeing him. But the woman who took the call 
the, the, how am I going to say this? She took the call at a certain time, and, and the police report, the police call, which was a matter of record, was 18 minutes later. Now, if the woman that took the call would have said it was 18 minutes later, it would have been impossible for him to have done it. But she said it was 18 minutes earlier. So if the lawyer said to her, you received a call that someone was dying, and you waited 18 minutes to call the police, so completely discredited her. Why was she lying? Because she thought the kid was guilty. Small town people, you know, sometimes these things happen. People get very prejudiced. They didn't like his mother. She was an alcoholic. She didn't have a good reputation in town. Excuse me. And then there were two young people that swore that they saw him in his car on his way home from the band. And where they were with the other trial, I don't know. But he was released. And it was, usually when you see a movie like this, they tell you at the end of the movie, well, here, th this is what happened to this one, and this is what happened to that one. There was no follow-up on it as to what happened to the young man for the rest of his life, uh, or what happened to those police officers that should have been, I think they should have been put in jail for life, or at, least for, at least for the amount of time that he would have been in jail. And what a terrible thing they did. What a disgrace to their office. What a disgrace to the oath that they take. So how does this happen you know, with someone that doesn't even mention God? Yeah. Because he's greater than the, the Pharisees out there, and the Pharisees out there, whoever you are. God is greater than you could ever imagine in your wildest imagination. His involvement in the lives of people, the reality of curses and blessings, the reality of, of how we reap what we sow in life, are beyond even my understanding. Just do good, brethren. Do good. Do good. Do good things. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be saved by good works. Okay. Saved means that your soul, that your soul, well, what does saved mean? Saved from bad things in this world. Saved from hell after death. There is no eternal torment. Saved means that you receive eternal life in this world. I think saved according to the church today would mean that you, that you enter into a relationship with Jesus, which is a degree of salvation. It's eternal life. To, have to, to enter into a relationship with Jesus is the impartation of eternal life. For this lifetime, it's eternal life for, for, your, for your soul in this lifetime. You're saved in this lifetime, saved from the destruction that's possible in this world, saved from all the terrible things that happen in this world. As far as salvation for your soul after the death of your body, that's a whole other, that's a whole other topic. I was listening to Ecclesiastes this morning, and uh, I haven't listened to Ecclesiastes in a long time, and it was just interesting for me to hear what I've been preaching because what I preach just comes out of the spirit, brethren. He clearly says that, and that's that's Solomon that wrote that. No. He clearly says we're just like the animals. The humanity are just like the animals. There's no difference. Who, who do you think you are? It's the soul inside of you. That's great. Okay. The soul inside of you that that is intended to be the spiritual husband's of humanity, we humanity, we, we are the outer vessel of the creation of God and we're likened to ignorant women that cannot defend themselves in a world where physical power is necessary. So the man is exalted, the male is exalted, or it used to be, he needed his male strength. We're likened to the helpless woman and compared to the powers and principalities that are trying to destroy us, we are helpless women. The problem is we don't know it. <laughs> Years ago, you see, movies about the perils of Pauline. Right? The woman tied to the railroad checks, saying, save me, 
save me. And a hero comes and saves her before the train runs over her. That's humanity, we just don't know it. We don't know enough to cry out, save me, save me. We're tied to the railroad tracks, and we don't know enough to cry out, save me, save me. So salvation in this world, the degree of salvation that's available in this world is likened to the woman tied to the railroad tracks. And we're saved in this world, we're saved from drug addiction, we're saved from alcoholism, we're saved from, from sexual sin, which has severe consequences. We're saved from the violence of this world, which has severe consequences. We're safe from being ourselves a violent, abusive person in this world, which has severe consequences. But the salvation of our soul after the death of our body is a whole other topic that is actually only addressed with people that are more spiritually mature. And that's just the truth. Everybody is not the same. Everybody's understanding is not the same. Everybody's degree of tolerance is not the same. That's communist thought that tells you everybody is the same. All the kids get the medal. It's just a lie, you see. It's a lie. So I don't know where all that came from, brethren, but that's what the Lord had to say to you today. <laughs> As his introduction, that's what he had to say to you.